women could play a key role in the outcome of the 2016 presidential race. Democrat Hillary Clinton has highlighted in her ads and in stump speeches how Republican candidate Donald Trump has spoken about women in the past. But what about other issues? We asked Martha Burke to stop by this week to share some insight into what research can tell us about female voters, particularly in the 2016 elections. Martha Burke, great to have you with us this week. Great to be here. All right, let's start with kind of the big picture. What do you think is at stake, particularly for the future of women in this election? A lot, a lot, because we have tax policy that affects women. Obamacare is huge in terms of how it affects women. What is gonna be the future of Social Security? It goes up and down the age range. Child care, uh, even birth control and abortion will be on the line. Now, what about, you said age range, but there's also, there's some different concerns and different issues for women at different economic levels. Absolutely. Are you hearing candidates talking about the issues for women in different economic situations? Yes and no. Okay. Uh, Clinton is talking about them more than Trump is, and one example I can give you is child care. Uh, Trump says he has a child care plan, but his child care plan is based on tax deductions. Who de makes deductions? People that itemize. Who itemizes? Higher income folks. Increasingly, not even middle income folks. So in his plan, if you don't itemize, you don't get the child care deduction that he's planning. In Hillary's plan, which is something that's already in place, she just wants to expand it, it is a child care tax credit. And that means it comes off the bottom line of your taxes whether or not you itemize. That is a huge difference, and it's by income and gender. You pretty much need a house in order to be able to itemize. Not everyone can afford a house these days. Now, what about uh, wage inequality? Is that an issue that you see playing out in, in some of these policies that you're talking about? Absolutely, at absolutely. And the most salient one is the minimum wage. Uh, Trump has said, everybody's making enough. We, you know, it's sort of the rising tide. We're going to. Uh, do a tax break for the rich and that's going to help everybody. Clinton says no, the minimum wage is not high enough. Now she's at $12 right now. Bernie Sanders was at 15 as we know, but that is low income folk. Who are the majority of minimum wage workers? Most people think it's teenagers. No, it's adult women. So that is going to play out in, in a gender way as well as an income way. And when we think about parents, women who are parents in particular, uh, the United States does not have a guaranteed maternity leave. We're one of the few industrialized nations that doesn't have that. Do you think that there's some political will to start talking about that issue? Yes, I do. Uh, we have had, as you know, for ever since the first Clinton administration, uh, we have had unpaid family and medical leave. But here's an interesting difference between the two top candidates on pregnancy leave. Trump has come out with a maternity leave policy. It is a policy that is strictly maternity leave. Hillary Clinton wants a family leave policy. What's the difference? Well, maternity leave is great for families that are having children uh, by natural means. It doesn't do anything for adoption. It doesn't do anything for men. Now, how's that gonna play out in the workplace? I'll give you an example. Uh, maybe we better not hire her. She's childbearing age. What if she had to take maternity leave? Now, if it's available to men too, that goes away. Same thing with promotions. New job comes up, well, gee, you know, she's childbearing age, better not take a chance. And the guy, not a problem. So when you say just maternity leave, there's a hidden little barb in there for women. Mm. You've been an observer of elections for many years. Do you think that this election is, is really different? Absolutely. I think this election is different for two reasons. Uh, one, it is coarser. Uh, it is more vicious. It is in many ways frightening. Uh, one of the senatorial candidates just made a statement about having a target on Hillary Clinton. He's had to apologize, but the cat's out of the bag, so to speak. There's a lot of... Uh, gun talk out there. Uh, Trump even said at one point the Second Amendment might be willing to do something about Hillary. Now what does that mean? We don't know. 
but it's been coarser. Uh, it's been, I think, for everyone, myself included, a very long slog. What else can happen? We don't know. Every time we think this has got to be the final straw, let's say uh, the uh, crotch and grab tape, uh, we thought that was the final straw. Then the Comey thing came up on the other side. Uh, a few more days. <laughs> That Donald Trump's comments about women both during the campaign this year and then his past comments that have come out in tapes, do you think that that really changed how women are following this election or how women may vote in this election? I do. I really do because the data show that Republican women, that was a turning point for many Republican women. And I don't know if you remember, but there was a huge Twitter storm after that. Tweet your first assault and millions of women tweeted, and some of it began when they were 10, 11, 12 years old. And it just sort of brought all that stuff to the surface. Believe me, sexual harassment and violence against women is a nonpartisan issue. Mm. Let's think for a minute. I know it's theoretical, but if there was a different, if a different Republican was up against Hillary Clinton as the first female candidate in a major party to be in the general election, do you think it could have looked different if Jeb Bush had been the nominee? Yes, I do. Side? And I think it's very interesting, Sarah, because what we have not seen in this election, because Trump has dominated with his crudeness and he's brought up so many other issues, but there is some basic uh, still feeling that a woman cannot be president. And Don Lemon was talking about that on MSNBC last night. He was saying, you know, a lot of male voters particularly, but a few women too were saying, well, really, a woman shouldn't be president. She can't handle it. We haven't seen that in this election because it's been overshadowed by all the other stuff. But had a more, shall we say, legitimate uh, mainstream man been running, I think we would have seen a lot of just plain out misogyny against a woman in high office. Policy is not just set by the president. Also, Congress plays an important role in these issues for women and families. About 19 percent of seats in Congress right now are held by women. Do you think if more women get into Congress, that would change the conversation, change the policy debate? Absolutely. We've seen that in uh, Norway, where they have actually a quota for women uh, in parliament. It's 40 percent. Once the quota was reached, what did the women do? They said, you cannot do business in, in the country of Norway unless you have 40% of women corporations uh, on your board of directors. What does that do? It helps close the pay gap. It gets more advanced policies in the workplace, like childcare, like leave. So yes, it makes a huge difference. And if you looked at the votes, just going back to Obamacare, when they took abortion coverage out of Obamacare, all of the women, across party lines voted against taking that out. Republicans and Democrats alike, they didn't prevail because there weren't enough women. But yes, it makes a difference. Do you think if Hillary Clinton is elected president, we could potentially see some more women running for Congress? Yes, I do. I think, and a lot of women are going to prevail this time in down ticket races that might not have earlier in the season. But as the men line up behind Trump, the women are lining up behind female candidates that have disavowed Trump. So yeah, it's an encouraging thing and I think it will uh, help overall. And I certainly hope uh, we see a, it's, it's about time. Women are the majority. Let's see a majority cabinet. New Mexico is at the bottom of nearly every list when it comes to families, education, income inequality. What changes for women do you think would improve the quality of life for all New Mexicans? Well, I think it starts with education. I think one huge area for us is teen pregnancy because teen pregnancy is a ticket to poverty for life by and large. A few women are able to pull out of it, but not very many. So we really need to work on that. We need to fund education. We need to get away, I think, from uh, a test-based thing to a, an achievement-based th uh, based thing that, that, that is not based on just one number somewhere. So I think for our girls particularly, but our boys too, all of this falls in together. Poverty makes unemployment, makes drug use, and, and we need to, to 
pull up our education system. Let me say one more thing about New Mexico, though. There, uh, Nate Silver, who's the main prognosticator about elections, did two charts. One was if only women voted, and one was if only men voted. And interestingly enough, I mean, there's no surprise, if only women vote, uh, Hillary's going to win. If only men vote, Trump is going to win, except in New Mexico. And if only men voted, Hillary would still win New Mexico. Interesting. Very interesting. One last question on the, you mentioned teen pregnancy and, and that, do you think that that is an example of how, the, what we talked about before, child care, wage inequality, that those things are especially pronounced for young parents. We have a lot of young parents in New Mexico. I've heard people say, this is where you really see the impact of those policies. It's not just about teens, but about, this is, this is a problem yes. for everyone, but these people are particularly vulnerable when they're younger and haven't established a career. Yeah, and this is something that I would like for people to start thinking about in a different way because many candidates, mostly very conservative ones, say we have too much government. We have too much government, let's cut the government. When they cut the government, what did they cut? Not the wars, they cut social programs. They cut people out of social programs. We've had a lot of trouble in New Mexico about outright illegally keeping people off food stamps. Well, if a kid doesn't have enough food, they're not gonna do well in school. Uh, if a family cannot provide, they're likely to turn to drugs, turn to illegal activity. And so it's all wrapped up together. We really need to think about when we say, yes, we need to cut the government, exactly what are we cutting? Martha Burke, you'll be here on election night. We'll see you then. Thank you. Looking forward to it.